Well, it's been one of those days. I'm uh, trying to get this uh, video put together for you. So I apologize for those of you that uh, didn't see the link right away. Um, but I get busy at times and I'm doing what I can. Um, next topic. So we were just talking about sound. Okay, and sound is where we are looking at waves, and those waves have mediums. Now we're moving on into light. Okay, and so now we want to look at light as a wave. And you may remember that we did talk about light probably in a chemistry class, and I know that there's a couple of you out there that didn't take chemistry, so you're going to hear kind of the, our perspective from the physics before you hear the chemistry perspective. But really, the chemistry perspective is a physics perspective. All right. So now we're looking at light as a wave, not as a particle. Now, light is nothing more than a very sub, a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? And the electromagnetic spectrum is this huge spectrum of all electromagnetic wave types. Um, they include things like microwaves and radio waves and, and x-rays and gamma rays, and we have the infrared and we have the ultraviolets, and then we have the visible light. Okay? And the visible light is a very, very small spectrum in the scope of this. Um, visible light is right here, and you can see that this picture that I took, we have increasing energy, we have increasing wavelengths, okay? and we see what our wavelengths are. And so at this end of the spectrum, we're at about uh, 400 nanometers. At this end of the spectrum, we're at about 700 nanometers. So we kind of generally see, there's kind of like this visual range that we're good at okay? when it comes to wavelengths. Um, now, uh, what is an electromagnetic wave? It's nothing more than, again, it's an oscillation, but it's an oscillation of two different fields, an electric field and a magnetic field, and they happen kind of perpendicular to each other. So they oscillate, okay, and it forms this energy, or they're carriers of this energy, and our eyes happen to be very good at perceiving this, okay? And we're going to talk about why we see colors at some point later in this, uh, discussion. Now, all light likes to travel at a speed, okay? There's that very high speed that light travels at. It does change slightly as we enter into different mediums, but this is the kind of, again, the key thing about electromagnetic waves is no medium is required, okay? You can travel through a medium if you so choose, like you can travel through air, and you can travel through glass, but you don't need a medium to travel through which means that light can actually travel through a vacuum. Sound has to have something to carry the energy. It can't travel in a vacuum. Good demo tomorrow. And if, if you uh, remind me right away, okay, whoever is first in the class, remind me right away if I don't have it set up, but I'm going to try to do the speed of sound through a vacuum or look at sound through a vacuum. We'll see if we can do that one. Um, but anyways, so we're looking at it in terms of um, it can pass through a vacuum where sound can't. Now, generally, what we like to do is we like to keep the speed of sound as a constant, and the constant is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Um, when we look at speed of sound, we now look at it in terms of this value C, which is going to be equal to a wavelength times a frequency, okay? And so C represents the speed of light. Um, we can then take any wavelength that we know, so maybe we know the wavelength of a purple light. Um, so I might have a purple lightsaber and I want to say, well, how much energy is associated with that? And that would be something that we could go into the energy equation, but we're going to kind of keep it a little more simple right now. We're just going to look at what's the frequency of that or something. So if my wavelength was, say, 400 nanometers, and I don't want nanometers, I want meters. In one meter, there's one times 10 to the ninth nanometers. That would give me my wavelength in meters. My frequency is what I'm looking for, and my speed of light is then three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. I would be able to then solve for my frequency based on these numbers. So I would just take this value and divide it over here to get my frequency equal to something, okay? So that's our basic problem when we look at um, electromagnetic waves when it comes to speeds, wavelengths, and frequencies. Okay. On to more interesting stuff when it comes to light. Okay. Because this is going to talk a lot more about light, and we're going to start to look at optics, we really want to understand how light travels. Okay. 
it propagates very similarly to sound. Okay, so sound traveled in kind of a spherical pattern. Same thing with light. Light from the light bulbs up above from any source, okay, has to travel in an extended kind of spherical thing, which means that we're going to see that same inverse uh, squared relationship. So as the light gets further away from its source, it gets dimmer. We see an actual loss in its luminous intensity. Okay, so we start talking about luminous intensity. One of those fundamental frequencies or fundamental properties, luminous intensity. So there's one back on the board over, or on the cabinets over there. Um, when we look at light, we start to look at those wave fronts, but we draw them in ray form, so we start to draw little pictures of rays. So you can see that here I have a light source. By the way, um, we start to use some different terminologies. Um, most things are luminous, okay, if they emit light. So if you emit light, you're luminous. If you're reflecting light, you're illuminated, okay. Um, if you allow light to pass through you, you're transparent. If, or I should say, if, if you can see through it, it's transparent. If you allow light to pass through it, but you can't see through it, it's translucent. And if nothing gets through, it's called opaque. So those are just some terminology words that you may see. It might be new vocabulary to some of you. All right. So now illumination is measured in lumens per meter squared. So in other words, this would be my light bulb and this would be my desktop. And so I'd say, well, how, how much illumination do I have on my desktop based upon the light sources that we have? And we measure it based on the lumens per meter squared. So it's, it's the amount of lumens, luminous intensity, um, per area. Okay? And that's how we figure out illumination. So E here represents illumination. I represents illumin luminous intensity. Um, and by the way, when we buy light bulbs, I know we buy them by the wattage, but usually if you look at the packages, you can probably find that it'll say so many lumens of light that it'll produce. This is even more so with the compact fluorescents that are out on the market right now because you want to look at them for their light output, not for their wattage use. And I know that everybody has an understanding that a 60 watt light bulb is this bright and a 100 watt light bulb is this bright, but we never really talk about them in terms of lumens. Lumens, okay? Um, so in other words, a 10 watt compact fluorescent might give you the same luminous intensity as, say, a 60 watt uh, incandescent bulb. Okay, and we'll probably look at bulbs a little bit tomorrow as a demonstration purpose. Um, so now, how do we measure the differences between the intensities of sources? And this is where we use this tool called a photometer. And a photometer just basically says we have two sources, maybe one's known, maybe one's unknown, and we then gauge the relative luminous intensity between the two. Okay, And that's kind of how we look at it. Um, the, some of the digital ones, and so maybe those of you that have had your senior pictures done, maybe the photographer came up and they had a little meter that they held up and they said, okay, it looks like we have about this much light. And then they'd go back and they'd grab a reflector and they'd try to bounce some more light in there because they wanted to have a little more illumination, okay? And so they looked at bringing some of those reflectors in or adding a, a light source so that we can get back light in. So a lot of the things that we look at about with light come into our photography aspects of things. Um, when we really start to look at light, we look at two main things that could occur. And the same thing kind of happens with sound. We just don't touch on a lot. In sound, we talk about the acoustics. Like the acoustics in this room are just horrible because you get sound waves that bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce, and so it gets very echoey. Well, the same thing's going to be true with light. Light has the ability to have reflections, okay? And so if we look at a light ray, a light ray will hit a wall and it'll be reflected, okay? Um, typically, we do this a lot with our mirrors, okay? So as light passes into the mirror, it gets reflected back out, and this is how you see yourself in the mirror. We usually have this thing called the law of reflection. The law of reflection is this, where the the angle of incidence, so we have an incident ray that comes in, is going to be equal to the angle of reflection that comes out. Which brings up some interesting situations like, 
how tall would a mirror have to be in order for you to see your full self? Well, you would have to have a mirror that would essentially be half your height because you'd be able to then look okay, into that mirror and then see yourself on the bottom side because the angle going in would equal to the angle coming out. Okay? Um, so we can kind of look at it in that standpoint to be able to see your full self. Um, the other property that we like to look at is this thing called refraction. Okay, and refraction, by definition, is a bending of a wave as it enters into a new medium. Okay, so entering into a new medium is going to change that a little bit. Like uh, sound waves traveling from air into water change. Okay, so you get a little bit of change. Well, we see it even more when we look at light. So this light actually changes as it or bends as it goes into it. So here we have our cat sitting up on the dock looking down at a fish. Now the cat perceives the fish here, but really the fish is down here because the light ray that they perceive is actually a bent ray. Okay, so our ray comes in and we have an angle of incidence and then we have the angle of refraction as it's coming back out. Or in the perception of the fish, the fish looks up, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle coming out. And so we look at our two mediums and we say, what's the difference in their optical density? Okay, so air happens to be less optically dense than water. So in other words, you can travel faster through air than you can through water as, as a light wave. Um, which means that if we're going from less dense to more dense, we bend towards the normal. Now, what do they mean by the normal? Well, normal is the same thing that we always use. It's the normal line perpendicular to the surface. Um, if we're traveling from more dense into less dense, then we pr um, bend away from the normal. So we're looking at the two different angles of how the cat perceives, fish perceives the cat, etc. Um, and so we're really going to start looking at this reflection and this refraction when we get into optics. Okay, Because optics is all about mirrors and lenses, and that's when we start to make images and get into cameras and you know, we might even have a chance to at least talk about a pinhole camera and, and maybe you'll get a chance to um, do some or look at some pinhole photography. All right. Let's see if my thing goes here. I've got about two minutes left. So, so the other thing that we want to talk about is Snell's Law. Because Snell's law relates this whole refraction thing. So the law basically says that we have a relationship between the angles and the mediums. Okay, And there's this thing called an index of refraction. So every op object has an index of refraction. And for this one we may have water. Okay, So water has an index of refraction. And then we have air. And air has an index of refraction. Um, and so we look at the relationship between those two. And we can actually then figure out, you know, how much is it going to bend? And that's a, kind of our nice little easy way to look at this. Um, because most situations we're always dealing with air, going from air into a medium, um, we may solve for N1, which is equal to N2 sine theta 2 over sine theta 1. And what I would then say if this is air and this is 1, okay, the index of refraction is equal to the sine of your angle over your sine of your angle. And if we're going from this way in, angle 2 is my uh, in, uh, incident versus my refract. Okay, and so we're just looking at it as a relationship. This is kind of the way that I'd probably put it in my notes, and we'll write it on the board that way so that we can kind of figure it out. Now, indexes of refraction are things that you always end up looking up, or we could calculate the index of refraction. We'll probably do that in a little activity when we do the Snell's Law activity. Um, and some of you maybe remember doing some of that in ninth grade. My time's almost up, so I'll continue everything else on another video. But this is a good start for our topic on light.